Hi, my name's Phil Craig. I'm a writer, a TV producer, a lover of stories, and a connoisseur of scandal. And I'm on a mission to bring you the most scandalous tales ever told. So thanks for joining me here at the Scandal Mongers Podcast. Good people of the internet, welcome once again. Welcome to the Scandal Mongers with me, Phil Craig. And welcome, of course, to the Australian Bar. What's on the bar this week? I hear a thousand voices asking. Well, actually, it's the first sign of Christmas. No, it's not snowing here in uh, beautiful Strawberry Hill, Twickenham, suburban London. But we are getting ready for Christmas because that is our homemade damson gin. Bit of a tradition here, sharing a bit more about my life. Thank you, Theo, for the advice. That's our producer. Um, yeah, we have a damson tree in the garden. Actually, it's not ours, it's the neighbours. But most of it sort of hangs over, so we pick up all the fruit. Plus, I have a secret deal, don't tell the tax man, with the next door's children. So we slip them a bit of cash for picking up the damsons on their side, and then we gather them all together. And most years we make damson jam, damson puree, very nice with venison, um, and damson gin and vodka. This year there was a bit short. Wasn't such a good harvest. So we had to prioritize. So naturally, we went with the gin. Hang on. Here it is. Isn't that beautiful? Yeah, it's a Christmas treat for us here. It's just basically damsons left in gin, a bit of sugar for about two months. And it goes this beautiful color, tastes amazing, lovely festive treat, just like a taste of summer in the middle of winter. So there you are. Damson gin. Works with vodka too. Um, Stay tuned for more cocktail recommendations. Good week this week. Again, numbers are up. I think it's 800,000. It's about our second birthday. Uh, I want to say our. I mean, Andrew and I started this pretty much exactly two years ago. And we've now got 800,000 downloads, which is pretty amazing. Um, We were told in our first year 100 would be good, then maybe 200 in the second. So we've done rather better than that. And it's just me now, but I'm really enjoying it. And it seems that you are as well. Last week, we got loads of great comments and loads of lovely, um, well, lots of lovely engagement in the comments too, um, in the show that we did with the wonderful David Hooper. But we also, the the, the previous week's show, which I think has gone way over 5,000 now on YouTube, with Maureen Callahan talking about the Kennedys, that's kept on growing. Um, And yeah, a lot of people just really enjoyed uh, David. Um, you know, and I think it was groundbreaking. I'm still talking to a couple of newspapers in here in Britain about whether we can get a story based on what he said, because I think what he said was really significant. Uh, here's a man that really knows some of the evidence that was collected, which is sealed. And it would probably take action at an official level to get it unsealed. He's calling for that. I think that's rather important. It was also just lovely to hear him describe the kind of wild and crazy time he had battling with the fires, all that stuff about bungs, as he explained non-British viewers and listeners. A bung is a wadge of cash, he said in his best lawyer accent. Well, that was very funny. Um, and several of you said we'd love to get David back. And yes, I will try because he, he was involved in all sorts of cases um, against all sorts of powerful men who didn't want their stories told. One of whom was, uh, was Maxwell, um, who we've touched on before in the podcast, but we've never really done a whole show on him. And he was an extraordinary and deeply scandalous man who had all sorts of, a bit like fired, um, fingers in the, the sort of world of high society and politics. Uh, with Max, it was the Labour Party, actually. He was all over. Uh, there was, a, it said at one point, you couldn't get elected to run the Labour Party unless you had the support of the Daily Mirror, which he controlled. So, and of course, he also has a very mysterious end when all the um, scandalous details of his finances come out and he disappears off his boat. Well, does he disappear? Was he pushed? Did he jump? We still don't really know. It's the end of the month. It's the end of October. We all know what that means. Comment of the month. And uh, Andrew always used to pick people who were saying nice things about his book. So I thought I'd do the same, especially given that I've got a book coming out in April. and I'm hoping to drum drum up some interest in my new book on here. Uh, But this is about my old book, and it's Claire E-A-N Light. Is that Claire Ian Light or Claire E-N Light? I don't know. But Claire, thank you for your comment, which was, I finally purchased your book on Diana. How did I miss it in my quest to figure her out? After a day and a half through, I have found it so well written, it really flows and has captured my attention. Thank you, Claire. 
Flattery will get you everywhere, or at least it'll get you a mug. So be in touch. You can email me through the link in the bio, and you can have a special gift to make you the envy of your neighbours. You can have one of the original ones, the original gangster ones with me and Andrew, or one of the newfangled ones with just me, um, just me and my bar carrying the torch for scandal. So please be in touch, Claire, and thank you for your comments. And it wasn't the only one, some lovely ones um, last week. Um, Sophia Braga, Sophia Rizbraga, David Hooper, what a gem, a groundbreaking list of information, great interview. Thank you very much. Wildflowers516, I think fire hurt a lot of people. Yes, he did. I enjoy your thoughts. And I also love it when you and Shauna have a chat on Vintage Read. Well, that's going to happen next week, I think. It's becoming a monthly event, which I very much look forward to. And I hope Shauna does as well. Um, Rebecca Donovan, 934, one of many people I'm guessing from Australia, who pointed out that I was wrong. I was talking about Lydia Thorpe, the senator who got up and started yelling at King Charles. And I said, maybe that's connected to the failure of the referendum they had in Australia on Indigenous rights. And Rebecca points out, and several of you did, that Lydia actually voted against that. So her motivation is even more hard to understand. But there you are. Um, I'm not as across Australian politics and the details of it. Um, and it's a full contact sport, Australia politics, believe me. Um, I used to be across it when I lived and worked there, but not so much now. But I do find it all very interesting. Nadia Amra, W4M. Hi, Nadia. Diana must have been out of her mind, Nadia says, to get involved with that cokehead and sex speed Dodi Al fired. But I'm not sure that, well, he did have a coke problem. I don't know about it being a sex fiend. But anyway, is she out of her mind to get involved with Dodi and Dodi's father? Well, that's a, a, a good link to talking more about fired because it's just, it's just getting worse. So much new stuff. And I spoke last week and I spoke to Shauna about, you know, what Diana thought she was doing getting involved and the, and the warnings we know she had. And I actually found a few in my files because I hadn't really put a lot of that in my book. I didn't do a huge amount in my book about the final year, actually. My focus was more about the marriage and the build-up and her childhood and all that stuff and what happened in the marriage and the spinning. Um, but I've gone back to my notes and, yeah, it was clear that she was warned. But it's also clear that the warnings were not really so much about him being a sex predator or um, the dangers of getting involved with them. You know, he was a he was known to be a scandalous figure. I mentioned this before. He'd been involved in this cash for questions scandal, which pretty much was a big part in bringing down the government, John Major, in um, 1997 here. But he was also seen as a sort of almost like a comic figure, sort of part of the national pantomime. Um, he was indulged. He was seen to be amusing, a bit different, a little bit out there, and a bit anti-authority, although he played that card both ways. He wanted very much to be in with the, the royals and the powers that be, but he'd been anti the Tory government. So people on the left were kind of thought, well, he's all right. He's sort of one of us. He likes tearing down, you know, kicking against the pricks, as people like to say here. Um, and so, you know, Diana, yes, she was warned. But she wasn't warned that much. And also, I think what we discovered with David was, you know, not much of this was out there. Yes, there was a Vanity Fair article, but we've heard from David last week that Fired was able to really smother that for several years, keep it very quiet with his legal, his PR action, the intimidation that seems to have gone on with witnesses. And yet David was collecting all this evidence, but it never, ever made the light of day because then when Fired and well, when Dodie died and Diana died, it was all settled and everything was put in boxes. And we don't really know what happened to a lot of that stuff. I'm not even sure David does, but maybe one day we'll find out. I think we should. And we should because this is heading for court in a big way. Um, 450, I think now, people have come forward. Many of them are joining these little class actions. They're British, they're American, they're Australian, they're from the Middle East, from the United Arab Emirates. Um, so many stories, uh, really scary quotes about people being uh, bothered and told, you know, do you really want to pursue this complaint? We know where you live, that kind of menacing behaviour. Um, and the Harley Street doctor, no, sorry, not the Harley Street doctor, that's important. The Harrods doctor, Jenny Duckham, who I think is uh, long retired in her late 70s, but she's come forward and she's spoken about these strange sexual tests and gynecological tests. And apparently, as the official doctor, she was asked to do them. And she said, no, I'm not doing that. Why would I do that? 
I do, you know, I test for eyes, for posture, for, you know, the, the normal things that might arise in a workplace environment. I don't, in pride to women's sexual health. So she didn't do them, but she was aware that they'd made arrangements in Harley Street where all the kind of fancy private doctors are and were, that he did them there. Um, and so it's weird. And, and obviously she was asked why she didn't make a fuss, which is a really good question. I think a lot of people are asking these questions. And, you know, it's the culture. Maybe it's what was expected. No, it wasn't. But those kind of health te- checks were not expected. Even in those days, of course they weren't. But maybe, and this is a quote from her, it was like he had a little court, a little empire, all happening behind locked doors on the top floor of Harrods. You couldn't get into it, she said. And I thought, well, you know, maybe he's a dirty old man and it's a bit horrible, but what do you do? The whole atmosphere was pretty crap. Well, she obviously kept her head down. She did a job. Why did she not speak out? Well, I don't know, pension, fear, Maybe it was just conditioned into people that powerful men at that time and for many years later, perhaps even now, powerful men can behave in these kind of ways and get away with it. Um, So, yeah, the more we learn about fire, the more it's a window into just an awful world. And I think this scandal is just getting started. There's more every day. Um, I'm certainly going to be doing more work on it. I'm going to, um, when I revisit my Diana book, which I think I'm going to do for a new edition, I might even do a completely new book, actually, where I take Diana's story into the era of Harry, Meghan, William and Kate, because I do think that a lot of what we're seeing at the moment does start with Diana um, after her death as well as before. Uh, I've talked about this before. So um, obviously when I do that, I'll go much deeper into fire. I'll try and find out much more to put in the book because, uh, you know, what was she doing on that boat? And what was happening on that boat that we don't know about? You know, the other thing that's coming out all the time is he filmed this stuff. David said that. In the interview last week, he was filming people. You know, he'd offer them hospitality. And even if you're a rich celebrity, you know, it's very tempting. You're in London. You want a bit of privacy. You want to live the high life. You're a movie star. You're a politician. You're a famous writer. Oh, Mohammed will put you up in one of his flats in Park Lane or a suite at the Ritz in Paris or, you know, special privileges for coming and shopping in Harrods. People love that stuff. And some of them were indulging in all kinds of bad behaviour, and he was filming it. Where are these tapes? And, of course, was he filming Diana? Did he have cameras on the boat? We don't know. But it's going to be a question that one day we're going to have to find out the answer to, because it's uh, it takes that story in a whole different and even weirder direction, I think. So, yeah, fired. Another week of fired scandal. So the main uh, subject of today's program is is nothing to do with the royal family or fired or anything like that. It's something that I'm really interested in, and that's aviation. Um, Clive Irving, you've been you've seen him before. He's been on here talking about the royals. That's one of his big subjects. Clive is a top writer, Daily Beast, and before that, he was one of London's leading journalists. He was a big figure on the Insight team, which was a groundbreaking uh, investigations unit on the Sunday Times. It's got a terrific, terrific uh, history of digging into these stories. And he's also an aviation nut, a bit like me. Um, and he's been looking at Boeing for a long time, and he was actually able to get access to Boeing. He'll, tell, he'll talk about this in the interview, I'm sure. Um, he did some really good books about the golden age of Boeing. Um, something I've worked on, actually, as a journalist, too. And we've, we've met some of the same people, but he did a really good book on that time. And that, I guess, peaked in the, what, early part of this century, and it's been going downhill ever since. Just in the last five years alone, the company's lost half of its market value. And this is not just any old company. I mean, this is one of the two big civil aviation businesses in the world. It's also very important in in, in, in military aviation, in, in spaceships. Um, it's just a really big business. It employs so many people in the States, you know, as, and in Britain and in other countries. And it's just a really big part of the American kind of economic scene. But for the last few years, it's been bad news to bad news accidents, mistakes, revelations, share price has gone down and down and down, like I say, by half. And it hasn't actually made an operating profit since 2018. And that is just not sustainable. And people are beginning to wonder whether it's going to have to be broken up um, and then and, or, or can it come back? Well, we'll talk about all that. Um, Tobana really knows and find out why. And also, you know, if you're interested in 
uh, aviation safety, because a lot of this is about crashes. Um, and um, if you're interested in that, and anybody who flies in a plane, when you strap yourself in, I know you are. I certainly am, and I used to be a pilot. You know, what's really going on? How safe is the plane? How well engineered is it? How well trained are the pilots? Are corners being cut? Well, the answer would seem at Boeing is the corners were cut, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I'll, let, um, I'll let Clive tell the story, and I will see you all after this at the end of the programme. Thank you for watching. Bye. Clive, thank you very much for joining me to talk about Boeing. Yes, Boeing. What a Boeing. scandal that is. That's a real scandal. Well, it is a real scandal, and you wonder, you're, you've that you written a lot about and you know a lot about. Um, I thought, though, before we got to the really scandalous bits, you could do a sort of pen portrait of the old Boeing, you know, what Boeing used to stand for. It's funny because I feel like almost I have a very personal family as, a, as though I'm part of the Boeing family because I had the great privilege of, of um, interviewing the 20 or so engineers who really were responsible in, in the 1950s for creating the jet age, the first jet, the international jet, the 707. Um, they therefore embody the brilliance and spirit of a risk-taking but technically Im impeccable and diligent company. So there's, that's a combination that is very rare, and they created it. Um, they took the sweat wing from a German secret source in 1945, applied it to a bomber, uh, several bombers, and then applied it to a tanker, which was to, to fuel the bombers, um, and then decided around 1950 that they could double the speed at which we traveled the world. That was, a, that was the first decision. Secondly, could you tame this machine, which was designed to fly at between 550 and 600 miles an hour, when the commercial airliners of the day, the four engine pist piston driven uh, planes were flying at 300 miles an hour. So there, you, you're not, this is not just a step change, it's a huge change for everybody involved. And as you're a, a pilot yourself, you'll know, understand what it must have been like um, transitioning from those old piston engine planes to something that not just flew that twice the speed, but because that increase in speed introduced all sorts of problems about navigation and la techniques for landing and taking off. But fundamentally at the bottom of it all was safety, was the, was the concept of this, if, if, if um, as it was at the beginning, if 250 people are going to fly on this thing, we've got to make sure that it, it, it's as safe as the old planes were. The concept of airline safety in those days was not like it is now. There were far more crashes. The, le the level of crashes per, per passenger in those days would have been totally unacceptable and unthinkable now. So we, we've gone through this whole arc, and, and Boeing played a huge part because when they designed the first jets, they were ahead of any of the regulators. The FAA had no idea of how you how you, you regulated something, a machine like that. So but basically, Boeing worked with the regulators, with the FAA, to, to, to make that, those planes as safe as they could. And yeah, whole... having kind of, as you say, invented the jet age and changed the speed at which we travel, they also then democratised it hugely by building well, a range of passenger jets. But of course, the most important and perhaps the most brilliant programme ever was the 747. Now, we've both met the man who, the lead designer of that, um, Mr. Souter, uh, and you've written a book about the origins of the 747. I mean, what a, I mean, that is the stuff of, stuff of legends. And not only was it an incredible plane that changed the way we all travel and made travel much cheaper, it was amazingly safe. Packed yes. innovations. Oh, yeah. God, the triple flaps, the triple flaps. I could nerd on about the triple <laughs> flaps all well, day. I, I but a, innovation, but safe innovation. I have a, I have four volumes of what was called the Bible that Joe Sutter created when they designed the 747. And they, these are the criteria. These are the technical specifications Never, never released outside of the company, but Joe gave me a, a set wow. of these, and it, it begins with the premise that the 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 priority at all times in every aspect of the design of this airplane shall be, and it was a shall be, shall be safety. But and it was, other, a, I mean, one of the great things of the seven four seven project was it was a sort of accidental. 
you know, they weren't even the it wasn't even the main thing the company was doing at the time. And some people were kind of skeptical that it would work. And they were they were looking at you know Concorde type planes for the future. Yeah, but the, the way the deal was done was amazing. In that, that uh, Bill Allen, who was the he- was the head of Boeing those days, and Juan Tripp, who was the head of Pan Am, they used to go fishing together. And on a fishing trip, they shook hands, and and Tripp said, "If you build it, I'll buy it." And Allen basically said, "If you buy it, I'll build it." That was about as much of a contract as they ever had. Amazing. And <laughs> these are two great pioneers. And they'd, they'd lost a, um, a military contract for, for the C5A, for the big lifter. And by, by designing a large four-engined uh, jet of that size, that gave them some, some, but not much, but it gave some practice in, in what it was structurally involved in building a, an airliner of that size. But, you know, the most important point for everybody here, I think, is that what you said earlier is that it democratised air travel. It, it, it changed the cost per seat mile, which is a thing that, all the airlines judge the uh, economics of a plane by the cost per seat mile went down hugely, and so it was. I think it was really the world's travelling machine. Everybody wanted one. Every country wanted one. Every head of state wanted one. The smallest African head of state wanted one for himself. You know, so it would be parked at the end of the runway in these small uh, air rock bands. Wanted everybody <laughs> wanted a jumbo, and yeah, and I think yeah. I've seen some research. I don't know how spurious it is that um, in the same way that the bicycle changed the way people met and mated and bred and kind of spread all kinds of new diverse combinations of human beings. The 747 did something like that on a global scale. You know, there were relationships and whole families that wouldn't exist were it not for this plane. That's that's true in, in many ways. I mean, it starts at the airport with masses of people at the airport, and then it goes to the plane, and then it goes to the interchange of of uh, nationalities, uh, people fly people flying to Europe for the first time, people from Europe flying here for the first time, all over. It, 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 I remember. It, I mean, the, remember the old Lakers Sky Sky Bus Sky Train, whatever they called it. You know, you could fly for an incredibly low amount of money when I was a student. I couldn't believe it. But anyway, look, we could go on and on about how wonderful Boeing was. Um, and yes, as you say, I used to be a pilot, and I know a lot of pilots, and they all thought Boeing was amazing. Airbus. Okay, but there were sort of like always issues. They pushed the technology. They got into trouble with fly-by-wire, if you remember. Boeing was the benchmark. So how did it all go wrong? So it all around one one airplane, the 737, which was designed. Joe Sutter was the the second in charge of the design of the 737 in the 1960s. And it was designed for, it was the smallest Boeing jet. It was called the 100 square jet because it was 100 feet long. Wingspan was 100 feet, and it was designed to fly 100 passengers. Um, and it, it had all sorts of teething troubles at the beginning because it was it was rushed, and uh, it was it was not thought to have had much of a future. It was a kind of puddle jumper that was going to be used between um, uh, on 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 the smaller routes between airports uh, domestically, not internationally. And then it turned out in the end, that they had the makings of a milk cow. So this plane became the biggest, bigger than my father than the 747, became the biggest money maker for Boeing. It was it literally didn't have to do much to, to, to turn it out. It was just being churned out and churned out. And so it went through several <clears throat> decades. It was vastly improved in the third version of it when they changed, put it to a new engine, and it changed the economics. So instead of carrying 100 people, it could carry 180 people. And it became the optimum jet for budget airlines all over the world. Here, Southwest Airlines, and in Europe, obviously, um, Ryanair was a big pioneer. And EasyJet, no, EasyJet actually went to Airbus, I think, in the end, not not the 737. Um, But budget airlines all over the world, because it looked on the balance sheet of an any airline, it was the cheapest plane to buy, and it was the most efficient for that kind of flying. So we get to the 90s. We get to the 1990s, and the question becomes: How much longer? How much life has this this design got left in it? A 1960s design still flying around all over the world ubiquitously um, in the 1990s, and they did one more version, which they called the new generation, which took them into th- this century. Uh, the question then becomes: Early in this century, can a mid 60s generation <coughs> jet uh, be any longer relevant for the for the 21st century. And they look at the books and they decide, well, we have a, a decision to make here. And this is, we're talking about 2010, 2011. 
do we do one more version of this thing, which means basically taking the <clears throat> uh, airframe and bolting on uh, new engines, which were the big transforming thing because they had new engines that were much more efficient, and making aerodynamic changes to the thing, but basically cobbling together yet another generation of the 737, rather than starting with a clean sheet plane that could accept and use all the technology then available that was not available when the plane was built, was designed in the other iterations. Mm. So by this time, the company has been taken over. The CEO is a guy called Mackin. Who Mackin took it over, Clive? Well, it's sort of taken over by a different, different culture in that they did a merger with McDonnell Douglas that introduced it was supposed to be a merger in which Boeing was the dominant partner. But then it kind of reversed itself almost organically inside the company because McDonnell Douglas looked at Boeing and said, we can make much more money out of this company than the company is making because they love planes too much. They're, they're too much like in love with planes and not enough in love with making money. And McDonnell Douglas made planes that was not com were not competitive to Boeing, but they had a balance sheet that was much better than Boeing's. So in the end, to, I'm, I'm making everything much shorter than it actually was. Um, the money men took over, and uh, uh, in, 19, in 2010 or 2011, the, the then-CEO, Jim McNerney, who came from General Electric. Now, this is important because there's a cultural flow of executives from General Electric under the tutelage of Jack Welch, who was a bottom line guy, a notoriously bottom line, a expert at getting them, squeezing the most money out of any company that they ran. Now, that may not matter too much if you're building refrigerators or domestic appliances, but when it comes to building airplanes, you cannot apply the same philosophy because, as I said at the beginning, <clears throat> it's a very expensive enterprise. You're designing a plane that's going to be used by millions of people. It's got to be absolutely safe. So anyway, McNerney decided they didn't need to build a new clean sheet plane because they introduced the one new one thing they feared, a new plane costs a lot of money to develop. And so rather than spending that money, because they, they had a policy of, of mind stripping the money, how do you make money out of a company like Boeing? Um, you, you avoid, how do you make the most money? Because your, Wall Street is asking for quarterly results that, that return as much money as possible obviously to the stockholders and remember that the people in the seat in the executive suite are also big stockholders they have a mutual interest in making as much money as they can out of this it's, it becomes instead of a plane making machine it becomes a, an atm a money making machine that's the philosophy so under that philosophy you look at the capital expenditure involved in building a new plane and you dodge it. And so what they did was to design the 737 MAX, which was a literally a compromise. And at the same time, by cost-cutting inside the company, the quality control and the attention to safety went out the window. So gradually... Well, I mean, has this been demonstrated beyond a doubt? that this? I mean, I know we're going to get on to the crashes, but I'm sure nobody at the time said, you know, good news, guys, we're going to make more money, but we're not going to be quite so safe. They would never have said that even if they meant it, and they probably never meant it. But I guess it's, there must have been some alchemy that reached down to the shop floor and affected things. How, how did that process actually kind of work? Well, that's a key question. Uh, a great air crash investigator who was also a lawyer that I worked with a long time ago on an investigating a 737 crash, actually, um, said to me, people will collectively make decisions in a boardroom that they will never make individually, that, that, that somehow their ethical standards and their sense of responsibility becomes collective and not individual. Uh, and I think it's a very fundamentally true thing and a, tr a true story. And that's what happened in this case, that if the people in the, in the C-suite adopt that, that sort of cynical mentality, it then penetrates all the way through. So the people, every line in the, in the, process of producing these planes were aware that there was a pressure on them to, to cut corners and to but particularly just if things slowed down they had to speed them up again because the pace of delivery was also an important part of, of keeping the cash flowing so in the course of i think about from the people i've talked to all this happened in about three years that the, the whole culture went out the window um and i think it's 
it's self-evident that it, with that, as that happens, the institutional memory goes too, which is another thing. Mm. So the people who are key in remembering what Boeing's approach was to the the smallest bolt to the largest part of the plane, they I know this, they went, they'd gone. And so so that was stripped out at the same time. So I've never known them. It's very rare. You mentioned Airbus. While this was all going on, of course, Airbus had produced the A320 over many, uh, well, about 20 years or so. And, and, and this, this A320, as you said, in, it introduced um, much more automation on the flight deck, and they had a lot of problems with fly-by-wire at first, but all those were solved. And the A320 was a plane that pilots preferred over the 737 because the flight deck was bigger. The 737 flight deck is a very, because it's designed in the 1960s for t- a crew of two it's very claustrophobic and narrow so each iteration of this plane the 737 they stuff more stuff in it so mm-hmm. the 737 max has all these screens in there which were rammed into into a, a, a cockpit that was never really designed for them so this um new approach to safety losing the kind of the institutional memory and the dna that had defined the company did this directly lead to crashes? Um, I mean, there were two famous crashes and other incidents as well yes, no, um, sorry, within it, the space it, of about six months. It, were they actually? Can you can can you draw a really clear line from things happening in the factory to you know smoking wreckage and dead bodies? Okay, so let's call, let's talk about what caused the crashes. The crashes were, were software problems. That there was a, a bug in the software. Uh, without going into into the weeds about what this did, it, it meant that they were correct. They put these larger, heavier, more powerful engines on the plane, which changed the, what's called the trim of the plane, the balance of it aerodynamically. So they had to put change the the uh, controls, the, the the power of the controls to overcome a, a thing called a pitching movement when the plane was beginning to put its nose up. They had to put something in that. The, what they call damp that put the nose down again. That's the simplest way I can think of it. So this was a software program. No one, none of the airlines were told that this was an endemic problem they discovered in the plane. They just delivered it with software they thought was reliable. Um, So when the first crash occurred, that was the Indonesian Lion Air crash. um, I started covering that story on a daily basis and I was, I was included in a group of reporters that Boeing gave briefings to every, basically were being briefed every day. And gradually over the course of several weeks, it became clear to me that they were going to blame the pilots and they were going to blame the pilots on no evidence at all, except that they had a a kind of racial bias. And they, and this came out quite explicitly. They thought that the non-European or non white pilots somehow had some cultural disadvantage which made them behave in a way differently to the pilots in the advanced western nation that's an outrageous idea obviously but it began to creep in so i challenged this and i said you're selling these planes to all these countries and there's been no history of any disparity of of of, of um the competence of pilots between there wasn't there was no, nothing no statistic to show that non-white western pilots were any more efficient than properly trained pilots anywhere in the world and the key thing is properly trained and one of the things they tried to do with the 77 max was to avoid the cost of making it necessary for pilots to go on simulators to transfer from the previous model to this one, that they should also, to, without any trouble, go on to it. But they'd not told anybody that there was, any of the pilots had not been told that this computer system was in there to, to take over what the computer was designed to, was to, to, to take over, imagine this, without the pilots knowing to take over and control this condition in the plane. So what actually caused those crashes was, uh, was that the base of the computers took over the plane from the pilots. And in each of those two crashes, the pilots struggled to correct something, but they were overpowered, overpowered. That is terrifying. I mean, this is like something out of 2001, isn't it? Um, and it's, you know, a plane that's pitching up, it's, it could stall. It's a, it, it's a good idea to have something to correct that. But if, it, if the pilots don't fully understand, and then if the thing has the power to override the pilot, oh, it's, it's, it's kind of frightening. The, the, the computers are telling that, 
the plane because the 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 but they were being fed information about what the airspeed was and what's called the angle of attack of the wings. That they were being fed, fed false information. So they then the computer responded to the false information and did something. Now this is another important point about these two crashes. People die in crashes in all sorts of ways. This was the most terrifying way for for, for three hundred and forty six people to die, which is in a high speed nose dive. In the first case, into into the water, in, in, in about thirty or forty seconds. In the second case, Ethiopia into the, in the desert and digging a huge crater. Everything is just smashed to pieces. People and plane all gone. And the Indonesian one and and the um, and, and Ethiopian one. Ethiopian one, same problem. Software. Yeah, the same. But six months afterwards, the same. So the reason why not, this is another scandal. Why was it, why did they have to wait for a second crash to occur before they grounded the plane? It wasn't grounded, and all 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 seven three sevens in the world were grounded after this for eighteen months. Imagine that. Well, you've probably said the answer because they tried to blame the first one on the pilots. I mean, this has been. Yeah. <laughs> if you look I, at the history of air crashes. This is a common refrain. I had this vigorous argument with the with the flax and even even with the top executives of Boeing, saying you can't resort to blaming the pilot through history. I've been, I've been. In, I've been involved in, in investigating a lot of crashes, uh, and the first reflex is always blame the pilot. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was outrageous. It was done on no basis, no technical basis. So the moral, the, the moral depravity of Boeing is shown ex precisely in this instance. Well, that's a terribly sad thing to say because of the past history of the company, as you know. And yeah. so, once they were grounded, I guess eventually the company had to admit that. This software was the cause of the accident. I mean, it must have cost them huge amounts of money. To, I guess they had to replace it in every plane, did they? Actually, it, yeah, well, more than that. They had to do a lot. And there was an argument between the FAA and the European regulators over what needed to be done before it was certified again. And the re Europeans were much more rigorous in their uh, demands of Boeing in, in changing the, first of all, looking exam, examining the software and changing this whole system. And secondly, they wanted more done. They wanted to up, update the safety equipment in the plane beyond what, where the FAA wanted it. So they had actually, the Europeans have played a decisive part in making the plane safer than, than the FAA actually wanted to make it. That's another thing. That's, because the FAA was so f closely in bed with Boeing that the, they had basically allowed Boeing to certify the plane themselves. Wow. So would you fly on a 737 MAX tomorrow without any worries um, now? I would say that, well, my son just flew on it, and he asked me whether he should, and I said, yeah, you should, but just bear in mind that um, it's perfectly safe now, but it's it's a, an old design with a very narrow cabin, the seats are tight, and it's not a pleasant ride, and it's noisy. All, all the things that the Airbus have ironed out, in the, the A320 is quieter, it's got a wider cabin. The seats are roomier, and um, it's an altogether better plane. The thing about the seven three seven now, the, the Max, is it's something that would ho have horrified Joe Sutter and that generation. It's a second rate plane. It's not a dangerous plane, but it's suboptimal, and it's certainly suboptimal for pilots because it's a curious hybrid of the old mechanical controls and and all, all the new automation. It's harder work for the pilots than a three twenty. Interesting. I mean, the software problem may have been resolved. Fingers crossed it is, has been, but um, it was only this year when a door fell off. I mean, yeah, no, to that, use the, the scary technical term, emergency decompression. There's another it, game. As it was flying on another, which I guess says something about the, 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 the quality control in the factory. Oh, the quality control is another issue, but there's another game they were playing here right until recently. Uh, this guy, Calhoun, who, who just went, who was the last CEO, they, don't, they didn't want to invest in a new plane and so they invented the cost of a new plane to scare the stockholders away from demanding a new plane so he set the price of a new plane at 19 million 19 billion dollars then it went up to 30 billion and it ended at 50 billion dollars which is absurd because one of the most successful new planes the a220 which was designed in canada um and then taken over by airbus costs nine billion dollars to develop so it they I've never known a plane company where the people running it didn't actually want to build a new plane. Usually the f first thing a guy who takes over a plane company does is he wants a plane in his own name, and he can walk away and say well, that's Boeing, right. I mean, you'll know this better than me, but didn't Boeing launch fairly recently, within the last decade, the Dreamliner, 
which everybody seems to love. I've flown on it. It's a great plane. It's a great plane, but it's... 787. Yeah, the 787. It's a great plane. It's a safe plane. And it, it's it's got wonderful, wonderful cabin comforts. And in fact, I spoke to the people. I was I was involved in, in, in a curious way in the design of it because I was working for Condé Nast Traveller. And they came to Condé Nast Traveller and said, we want you to do... Um, a kind of poll of your readers because they're all upscale travellers. What what do they most want that they don't get in an airplane cabin? So we did this poll and they and Boeing absorbed it and they 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 designed this much better cabin atmosphere and lighting and seats. Uh, uh, partly only partly as a result of the poll that we did. Oh well, well, I'll, uh, so thank you. The next time I settle in for a long flight to Australia in a Dreamliner, which I've done a few times. Okay, so we, we talk we talk about kind of culture of safety and mistakes and software, but actually, and again, you know this way better than I do, Boeing also had to admit to a certain level of fraud, didn't they? Yes, they did, because they faked, they, they, they faked the, can you believe this? They faked the inspection results uh, on the production line of the 787. Uh, the problem with the 787 was it's a wonderful plane, but they, they, they created this very complex supply chain. It was the first... Uh, plane built of composites and not metal and so this was farmed out to spain and italy japan um and various subcontractors all over the us and the uk a lot of uk stuff in it too and that proved to be extremely inefficient and costly and um, so they brought it all back to to charleston south carolina and they they they're building the so th this is a separate issue entirely the, the quality control on the production line Bits didn't fit, so they 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 could chiseled bits off and made, sort of made them fit. That's <laughs> you know. why doors that's why doors fall off in the middle of a flight. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> but it's a it's affected the space program too, hasn't it? I mean, I think well, I don't it, think it, I knew this till I started doing a little bit of background for this interview. That Boeing is one of the reasons why those those, those people were stuck in space for several yeah, weeks. Yeah. Well, it, it's infected the whole organisation. The defence program has been for every every Boeing um, uh, Pentagon contract is either over budget. Well, they're all over budget and very late. And Air Force Air Force One, which is the replacement for the current Air Force One, which was supposed to have been flying by now or a year ago, because it was actually agreed to under the Trump administration, the first Trump administration, and Trump had a row with the boss of. Boeing then saying it was going to cost too much and could they cut back the costs and they resolved this in the end it's now not the first flight's not going to play take place now until 2026 Golly. what happened with nasa was that a boeing error or? yeah that's no that's the same thing that's a software problem again you see i you be, i begin to think the com competition for the best software engineers is intense everywhere and since Boeing were not playing, paying top dollar, they didn't get the top software people. And so the rockets, I, I, I generally don't know much about this story, except there was some failing that meant they couldn't bring those people down from the space station. That's right, because the, 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 the little jets that control the attitude of the capsule as it, as it gets to this space station and docks, they weren't working properly. So they had to fly it manually because the automatic. So they judged that it wasn't safe to take them back to Earth because they couldn't guarantee they would get through the, the heat shield part of the right, flight. Golly. But, yeah. All right. Well, some people watching or listening, if anybody is, I hope they are, might say, oh, come on, Clive, you, that's not this left-wing anti-business, anti-enterprise whinging. You know, what's wrong with running a company to make a profit? Boeing was never a charity, even in the glory days. Isn't this isn't the answer to this that you can make a lot of money as Airbus is doing, and become the dominant airplane manufacturer in the world if if, if you observe the highest standards of engineering, and uh, and efficiency, engineer safety and efficiency. Airbus can manage it, but Boeing can no longer manage it. Uh, it's not a, a it's not an I'm not anti business. I love Boeing. I, I, Boeing have, have a tremendous brand which has now been destroyed i know destroyed is a strong word but the brand has been destroyed people don't trust it in the way that they did anymore well that was my my last question to you actually so getting to my half hour limit here um what yeah. do you see as the future of boeing would it have to re reinvent itself with a new name you know new leadership new culture 
I think they may want to break the commercial aircraft division off from the rest of the company, make it a standalone, rebuild it from scratch, uh, because all the criteria involved in building a commercial plane are very different to all the military contract. It needs a different culture and a different set of people. And I think that's that's the only way in the end in in which they will recover their quality and become competitive again to Airbus, by which time, of course, there might be someone else like Embraer in Brazil who's taking that position instead because there's a lot of competition now. Yes, I mean, we've got used to there being Airbus and Boeing. I mean, I'm, is there a Chinese entrant in the race to build commercial oh, airliners? Very few countries can manage to build commercial airliners. The Russians are not very good at it. The Japanese spent an awful lot of money trying to do it and couldn't do it. And the Chinese are doing the same and they can't do it. There's a kind of finesse involved. There. There's a secret source somewhere in there that, that, that the American and, and, and the French people understand very well. But you, you, it's, it's, it's all about finesse in aerodynamics and understanding what happens to a plane when it's flying. I mean, it's it's just a, a magic source. Some people have it. And well, Joe Souter had it, didn't he? And, the, yeah. and the, that generation. Um, and there's some romantic about Boeing. You, you've, you've been to that huge factory, isn't it? The largest building in the world where it used to be. You, this factory outside Seattle, it's so vast. You have to take a kind of like a golf cart to go around the various bits of it. It has I mean, its own love it. It's its own climate in there too. You sometimes you get a kind of fog in there. <laughs> it's no, wonderful... I love all that. I, I am sorry to hear. Well, I mean, I guess I knew, but I'm sorry to hear the details from you. How it all went wrong. Well, I'm going to hope that they get better. I want to fly Boeing for the rest of my life because I, I do. I love the history of the brand, and as you say, they invented this uh, yeah. world-changing yeah. thing called commercial well, jet say, travel. It's like a family thing to me because I, Joe Sutter and I were very close. Got very close towards the end, um, and. Invested in that one man, Joe Sutter, was the whole legend in one man, the legend, all the expertise, all the knowledge. And he looked at me sadly about my saw him six months before he died, and he said, It's not the same company anymore. Oh, that is sad. That's Joe Sutter, the designer of the 747. Awful that he that was his last because it was his family, wasn't it? It was his life, that company. Yeah, his life, and what a man he was, too. Oh, what a man he was. Such a rigorous oh, well. Man. Um, well, I'll, next time we're being both upgraded um, into the first-class suite between New York and London, <laughs> we can raise a glass to Joe. Great to talk to you, Clive. Okay. Fine. Thank you talk so much. You. So interesting. Okay. Talk bye. to you soon. Bye. Oh, yes. Upgrades to first class. It did happen. Not in the life of a struggling writer and podcaster. It doesn't anymore. But um, I had a few moments like that um, on lovely Boeing's. Lovely. Planes of all kinds. Yeah, what an interesting story. Clive's such, such a cool guy. Um, we like talking to him. We'll have to have him back. To have him back soon talking about Harry and Meghan again. <laughs> that always gets people cross because he's a bit of a Harry fan. Well, you know, Harry and Meghan, divisive subject. But um, in terms of what Harry's been doing, t- taking on the tabloids, Clive is very much on the side, as indeed am I. So here we are back at the bar. Towards the end of another program, lots coming. Uh, I think next week we're going to be going back to the Second World War. Helen Fry, brilliant historian, has written a wonderful book about the women, um, British female agents in the well, in the Second and the First World War, actually, and it's really cool. And some of the stories are very hair raising and a little bit scandalous, but very interesting. So I think we'll have Helen. Um, other things coming up: we've uh, Churchill's Bandits. Um, a new book on Wallace Simpson. I'm just talking to the writer. I think he's going to come on the show. Um, all about her time. You know, we don't really think of Wallace before she meets Edward, do we? I mean, most of us just regard her as the, the woman that, that sort of took him away from the, the throne. And we know that she had a fairly racy life. Um, and the friends and um, Sam and Heather said on the podcast recently, um, the, the, the king and the establishment didn't like the circle that she came from at all. But what about her in the 20s? And what about her in China? All kinds of stories about what she was getting up to then and the various skills in and out of the bedroom that she may have learned. And that's what this book's about. And I think it's going to be really cool. So we'll talk about Wallace in a couple of weeks. Um, Also this week, I did the interview I've talked about on Lord Byron and the Gothic imagination, the birth of Frankenstein and Dracula. Uh, and Mock O'Keefe joined me as a co-host, so that'll be coming up soon. 
So many more scandalous treats between now and Christmas. Uh, and between now and when I opened the first bottle of Dabs and Gin, I should have said, it's not neat. You don't drink it neat. Come on, guys, get a grip. Um, what I do is we shake it over ice for quite a long time. So it gets cold and dilute. Serve in a little martini glass. It's perfect. Perfect Christmas treat. You don't have to grow the damsons. Get out of the shop. Works with plums too. So enjoy yourselves. There you are. Free cocktail recipes. Free scandals. What more do you want? So in return, please give me a like. Please give me a subscription. If you're feeling generous and you want to keep me in gin, you can even give me a couple of dollars by clicking the link next to the three little buttons on YouTube. Um, I think it's now on Apple as well, on the um, sound apps. I'm not even sure. I hope it is because I could do with a bit of a treat myself. All right. Thanks very much for watching and see you all next week. Bye. This has been a Podcast World production. If you want to contact me, write to team at podcastworld.org, placing scandal mongers in the heading, or you can reach out via the social media links in the show's bio. And if you've enjoyed this episode and you want to support the show, please consider taking a few seconds to hit the donate button found just below this video. Many thanks and see you next week.